<clears throat> well, folks, online and here in the big auditorium, there are a bit fewer than this morning here in this big hall, but all the presenters, all the panelists, they are here. That's the most important thing. And then we have a few online, I see, and some of the yeah, more and more coming in. So well, that's good. And uh, we have our session, which because now we are di divided into six, actually, different sessions on of uh, various topics. And uh, this is the session one, uh, which has the topic virtual reality and digital reconstruction. And we have five presentations. Uh, there's one stand-in for Ray Lafferty, uh, Bess Roach from Historian St. Andrews is going to step in for him, worked with him on the Finlagan project, but all the others are here on online. So I think we just rolled, put, put, put started, started, but uh, just the practical things, we will take some questions and answers after each presentation, but then in the end, hopefully we could, we can have a little good conversation and uh, and then we can yes then then people also online can share their views we have two hours ahead of us and uh, that's about 10 to 15 minutes though for each presentation and it goes up to and it is very soon up to 20 when we have some questions and answers but we'll see how it goes but virtual reality and digital reconstruction, that is our theme in that one. And uh, we will start with a presentation about the Finlagan project. So now we will. And uh, yes, and that is on the screen now. So that's, yes, please. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be with you all. Um, can I just check, can, can you hear me all right in the auditorium at the moment? Yeah, yeah. we hear you well. Excellent, fantastic. Well, I'm going to share with you a little about our reconstruction of the medieval archeological site at Finlagan on the west coast of Scotland. This was a collaboration between my own research team at the University of St. Andrews, led by Alan Miller, and um, also the Finlagan Trust, which cares for the heritage site. And you would have had Ray Lafferty, um, but he sends his apologies. Unfortunately, there's a major crisis with the bridge accessing the site. Uh, so he's dealing with that. Um, and I'm afraid you've got me as an understudy instead. So I start off with a little bit of context about the Magan and the nature of the site, and then go on into the story of the digital reconstruction and how it's been communicated to visitors. So the Lagan is in an absolutely beautiful spot on the island of Isla, on the west coast of Scotland. The site itself, um, there's a visitor centre on the shores of Loch Lagan. And then the archaeological remains are particularly focused around two islands. There's Ellen Moor, which you see a picture of and which is accessible to visitors in normal circumstances by a bridge from the shores of Loch. And then there's also another island, Ellen Nicola, or the Council Isle, which archaeologists have been able to access and which historically was linked by a causeway to Ellen Moor, but which now currently visitors can't access. As you can see, it's a very beautiful spot with sort of wonderful natural heritage, but the archeological remains which are visible above ground are actually quite limited. The surviving standing buildings are really restricted to the building that you see in the right of this image, which was in the Middle Ages, a storehouse, and then later on in the 16th century became a dwelling house. And also there are some standing remains visible of the medieval chapel. But in the main, 
what you've got is two islands with sort of some lumps in the ground, really. So it's a site which this historical significance of isn't immediately apparent, yet it was historically very, very important indeed. I'm not sure how aware you are of the complex history of the formation of the Kingdom of Scotland, but the west coast of Scotland, although for quite, a, quite an early date, um, did sort of acknowledge the overlordship of the Kings of Scots, it wasn't completely integrated into the Kingdom of Scotland. It had quite a high degree of autonomy. And um, the large number of the islands and the coastline off the west coast came under the government of the Lords of the Isles. And you can see on the right, you can see a map um, encompassing roughly the area covered by the Lord of the Isles at its largest extent in the 15th century. Now, Isla, and specifically the, the site at Finnagan, lay at, this was really the main political base in the Lordship. I mean, there are a number of significant sites, but it was probably the most important residence of the Lords of the Isles. And it had a huge political significance. One of the islands, the island is now referred to as Ellen Nicola, um, which is the circular island that you can see to the right of the aerial image. That is thought to have been the base for the Council of the Lords of the Isles, who sort of dealt with uh, legal matters and sort of provided advice to the Lords. Finlagan um, was also um, the place where the Lords of the Isles were historically inaugurated um, in a ceremony that's thought to have taken place on a mound on the shores of Loch Finlagan, known as Nakshanda. And the main island, Ellen Moor, was the, the location of a fairly large um, medieval elite residence, which would have been used as sort of a gathering point, a place for entertainment, a place of display, and a political centre. So this was a place that really, really mattered in the past. Our understanding of the site has been dramatically enhanced by important excavations that took place in the very end of the 20th century and the start of this century. It, they were undertaken by the National Museum of Scotland and they were led by Dr David Caldwell, who we were really fortunate to be able to work with and to advise our project on the digital reconstruction of medieval Finnagan. They found they worked in quite difficult conditions in some ways, um, particularly as some of the most interesting finds were recovered from the area around the causeway that used to lead between Ellen Nicola and Ellen Moore. Um, however, they had to sort of build sandbanks and sort of dams to hold water off to investigate where the former causeway was. And it was generally it was sort of rather wet and difficult circumstances. That being said, they found some wonderful things. It really, the excavations really clarified our understanding of the locations of buildings, and they found quite substantial stone remains. And you see on screen to the right, you can see um, the remains of the altar from the chapel. You can also see remains of one of the doorways of one of the buildings on um, Ellen Moor. Um, and as you can see, these, these are substantial structures with sort of decorative detailing around the doorways. And because there was also a lot of waterlogged material, particularly in the area around the causeway, they also managed to recover a lot of organic matter. Um, you see there timbers, um, but they recovered things like a lot of leather items as well. So really, really rich resource on which to draw. And without these excavations, our project really wouldn't be possible. I think it's important to stress, although the Lagan is in a place that we nowadays regard as relatively remote, it undoubtedly had a complex culture and it was interconnected um, to the wide, wider European networks. And it also had an element of luxury and comfort to medieval life on these islands. Um, you've got a few samples of some of the artifacts recovered here. Um, we've got this sort of decorative dog collar, um, me medieval decoration from dog collar, made to look as though it's from gilt. Um, so this is probably from one of the Lords of the Isles hunting dogs. Um, we've got evidence of sort of connections with um, Italy and Rome. We've got a pilgrim badge from Rome, which you see at the top right hand corner. And there are other evidence of connections to continental Europe. There was ceramics from France, um, possibly associated with the importing of wine. 
And there's also quite a lot of evidence of recreation on the site. And um, we've got things like gaming pieces and, and other examples of recreation and sort of fragments of musical instruments as well, actually. So we've got an unusually detailed understanding here of, of this medieval residence, particularly for, for, for a site um, in, on, on the west coast of Scotland. It's, it's wonderful um, the amount of evidence that we do have. Why, though, did we feel it was so important to work on the reconstruction? And why specifically did the Finlagen Trust approach us about it? And did they feel it was something that their visitor centre needed? I think you get a little bit of an idea if you look at something like this picture of the Great Hall. This is the remains of the Great Hall as they are today. Now, the excavations actually showed a huge amount of what this building used to be like. But when visitors come down to this location now, they really see some bumps in the ground with a few pieces of masonry um, visible. So it's very hard for them to grasp. This was once a luxurious space. It was a comfortable space. It was a place where the laws of the arts would have displayed their power and culture. And it's possible, of course, to do some things with interactive signs. And there are a few signs around at the heritage site. But both because we, they didn't want to sort of damage any of the archaeological remains and also because one of the attractions of the place is its sort of engagement with nature as well and this rather scenic setting that it has they didn't want to have signs absolutely everywhere so a digital reconstruction which was then to be experienced either at the visitor center or via a mobile app seemed to be an appropriate way to help people understand what used to be there was not damaging the special nature of the heritage site as it is today. So this is Great Hall as, as it was around the time we started the project in 2018. And this is a representation of how we sort of first, first illustrated it with our reconstruction. So we commenced um, in 2018 work on a reconstruction that was initially installed in 2019, although work on the project still continues. What you see here is a um, representation of the exteriors of some of the buildings um, towards the end of the island nearest to the causeway leading to Ellen Nicola. So we're here, we're on Ellen Moor, we're on the large isle, but we're quite near the causeway leading to Ellen Nicola, the council isle. And what you see on screen here is to the left hand side, there's a building that we think was part of the Lord's private quarters. You then see a boundary cutting off that sort of end of the island, restricting access there. And then you can see the Great Hall in the background. And then in the foreground, you can actually see the building that there's still some standing remains from today. That, that was in the Middle Ages storehouse, later became a dwelling house. The dimensions and locations of these buildings are fairly reliable. They were based very closely on the archaeological evidence, which also, of course, gave us wonderful insight into things like where the doorways were located. The materials that they're built out of are based on information from the archaeological evidence. There are some questions about some things to do with building materials. We think that the hall probably did have some, did have some stone, stone roofing materials. Um, we think that a number of the other buildings on the island probably had organic roofing materials. Some buildings, um, we do have a few clues about um, the windows, but the vast majority, things like windows detailing of um, the design of the upper parts of gables, things like that. That's something that had to be purely conjectural. So we represented the main buildings and the exteriors of the all the main buildings on the two islands of Ellen Nicola and Ellen Moore. But we also try to represent the interiors of quite a large number of buildings. And you see here the reconstruction of the interior of the Great Hall. Again, you saw the, 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 the space that you saw in its modern um, open air form today. This representation that you see here um, was one of the earlier versions we produced, and it's a blend of stuff that's rooted in archaeological evidence, stuff that's inspired by other sites, and stuff that is, is pure guesswork. So things like the fact that there were three fireplaces, there's three hearths at um, one end of the hall, um, the archaeologists discovered that, and that's something that is actually to be found in some other Scottish elite residents, including Linlithgow Palace. 
The detailing having um, carved stone heads as the corbels supporting the roof, um, but they also found those in archaeological um, remains. However, some other aspects, things like the fire screen things that was borrowed from some um, medieval illuminated manuscripts, the construction of the timber roof um, was borrowed from looking at other examples of medieval halls. So it's, it's a mix of things that we could reliably read in evidence and, and things that were guessed. You may notice this, there's tartan on the walls. Um, that was a decision that was taken in, in conjunction with David Caldwell, who excavated the site, who has got evidence of striped material. Um, in records from the period, and he thinks the reference to strike material may be a reference to, um, to tartan, just possibly. You may have noticed though, that the previous scene was empty of characters, and the original version of the reconstruction that we released and installed in, in the visitor centre in 2019 had no historical characters in it at all. And this was something that a lot of visitors commented on. And we were also very conscious that the spaces we were talking about were spaces that were in some ways a backdrop for human activity. They were a backdrop for the playing of music, for the giving of justice, for feasting and networking and entertainment. And so we were very anxious to try and include um, people, historical characters in the reconstruction. But this is not without challenges. As you may well be aware, sort of when architects and people create virtual spaces, they tend to use stock characters to sort of just people their sort of mock up street scenes. But the stock characters that are available for the Middle Ages on, on, online um, that you can purchase are pretty poor and none of them really relate to the sorts of costumes that would have been typical in the 15th century on the west coast of Scotland. So we were very, very lucky to collaborate with a costume historian at the University of St Andrews, Patna Westhoff Nyman, on researching what the likely clothing of the people that from Nagam was, and then creating sample, um, sample designs, which then our team went on and turned into um, virtual characters. So the figures that you see here are just two of the number of the characters that created. Um, the, the, Akerton, the pad, padded jacket that the man at arms is wearing on the left, is influenced by um, the, the, the garb shown on some tombstones um, from Isla um, of uh, armed men from the late Middle Ages. And the costume of the elite woman on the right is influenced by some of the dresses um, seen on tombstones, um, in fact, from Iona. So not quite the same area, but um, contemporary and still from, from a Scottish island. So this is what the hall that he looked like, uh, saw earlier, looked like with some of the characters. So it's sort of a busier space interacting. Um, we've also undertaken a few updates um, amongst other things to things like the lighting um, and also to how we approach things like the hangings on the walls. So it's, it's hopefully a more immersive scene, more, more active scene. Um, and you're, you're remembering that this very much was a community, um, a court, who lived here. Of course, creating the reconstruction is, is only one phase of it. Um, and the reconstruction was, um, was, was modelled and then placed into the Unreal gaming engine. Um, and I have to say here, um, massive shout out to my colleague, Sarah Kennedy, who really did the bulk of the modelling. Um, and also to Ian Oliver and Lucy Hardy, who also worked on the digital aspects of the project. So what we did was we had this reconstruction in Unreal, and that's been great because it's enabled us to do quite a lot of editing and development. And you can actually see this is a slightly revised version of Finlagen that we've been working on. And as you can see, it has progressed a little bit from the version released in 2019. But it also has made possible and will make possible release in various different forms um, of this reconstruction. So we currently have a virtual reality exhibit on site at the Vista Centre. And this has been a really, really important part of what we've provided to, uh, to the Finlagen Trust. Previously, the Finlagen Trust didn't have very many interactives at all. They had a lo lovely Vista Centre with some of the amazing artefacts 
that has been discovered um, from, from the site. But there wasn't very many activities that people could do in the visitor centre. So this has provided, having the virtual reality exhibit, has both provided a much greater understanding of the site when people go down and, and look at the archaeological remains, but it also has provided a sort of totally different aspect to the offering of the visitor centre. Because Isla doesn't have the same sort of footfall that somewhere like Edinburgh or somewhere would do, um, it is possible to have an interactive that has quite a long dwell time, that people can spend quite a long time engaging with. And people do find that they, they the, the visitor centre has found that people do often settle down for quite a long time to explore the virtual reality exhibit. Um, the exhibit incidentally um, was initially with an Oculus headset with a screen, um, although they stopped using the headset for a while during the pandemic. It also, so another significant point I should perhaps mention about it is it's dual language, it's Gaelic and it's English. Um, and that was something very much that the local community wanted, representing both the Gaelic that would, would, would have been very much, of course, a part of the heritage of Isla. Um, and of course, which still is um, a, a language that people are working to um, increase the use of in this region of Scotland. We've also been working on the development of the mobile app. So there's sort of virtual reality experience at the visitor centre, but we're working on a mobile app that people can take down to the islands themselves. So they've got something in their pocket to compare what it looked like in the past with the present. Also importantly, we've produced some videos relating to the project, which were released online, and we will be doing more updates to these. And I think these are quite important because they're very readily shareable. And it was these videos that we were able to, when we launched a project in 2019, to link people back to. And it got quite a bit of coverage with things like the BBC and some major national newspapers. And that actually produced quite significant uptake in visitor numbers at um, the Venaga Visitor Centre. So I should emphasise that this is a project which is ongoing. Um, if you're interested in finding out more, you can find out how to visit the Penagan Visitor Centre. There's, there's um, the website of the Penagan Trust up there. If you're interested in seeing the original reconstruction as it was in 2019, um, there's a link to a video um, there. Um, we are working on an updated version. You can see a still from the updated version, so look out for more. Um, there's also a little introductory video to the project, and if you're interested in exploring some of the artifacts, um, there's a little online collection of some of the artifacts that we discovered. But I have to say, this is very much an ongoing collaboration. So there may well be more news and updates in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bess. So let's see if we have some questions for you. Otherwise, we take it to the end. That if it's not, I mean, it's uh, well, yeah, yes. Come, come a little bit closer and, and, and I, I, I do apologize. I'm so sorry, I can't hear. I do apologize. Sorry, you hear anything? Okay, is that any better? Yeah, that's better. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. This makes it sound look like a much more important question than it is because I've walked <laughs> all the way up here now. But I was just interested in what you're talking about with the creating of the characters and that originally you you and your team had decided not to have characters in it and then the, there was a sort of a desire from the community to, to have that. And I wondered if there was a sort of another reflection process when you looked back on it. Um, how, how do you feel personally about the characters and, and were the community happy with that, that outcome? Because I think it's just such an interesting topic. Like, I, th I think characters are so interesting. I think we would always have been open to the idea of characters, but we're just very, very conscious of the challenges in getting there, if that makes sense. And particularly when we were working on a project with limited funding and we were able to get additional funding, which, which enabled the, 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 the representation of the characters. I think that... Something about digital reconstructions generally, um, perhaps because of the, the, I think a lot of them sort of owe their original origins to people who are architectural historians in many ways. Um, I think we've had a tendency to focus on 
buildings disproportionately. And I think buildings are really important and wonderful to study. But I think that probably means that we don't spend as much attention as we should do on the landscape and natural setting, um, which is something that we have in, in, in actually in relation to this project. Our updated version is actually having a more detailed version of the land surrounding landscape than the, the original version did. And also, of course, there is this question of the people and who inhabited it. Technically, it was made possible to have the characters because what we did was we took figures that people had created and made open access. Which, so we took the rigs of movement and things like that and facial features and things like that and then clothed them in our own clothes that we modelled. So this was partly made possible because other people were willing to share the results of their research and their efforts and modelling time in creating sort of animated figures that we then were able to edit and adjust and put relevant medieval clothing. I think it is a really, really worthwhile and a really, really important step forward and is something that where we have the resources to, I'd really like to see integrated into other reconstructions. But I will totally say that it adds a whole level of complexity to the project, certainly. But I think it's a worthwhile one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, give your hand again. And uh, then we had for the next, then we had to Iceland, and uh, that is Thruster, which is not in person here. He is somewhere in the, in the mountains in America, I believe. But Thruster, can you, can you hear us? Yes, you can you again? hear me? We can hear you. All right. How's it going, everybody? I'm in the mountains of North Carolina in the <laughs> moderate temperate jungle. Um, so, yeah, um, uh, my project is the Einar, Einar Jonsson Museum project. Um, for those of you who don't know, Einar Jonsson is one of Iceland's first sculptors. He, his uh, museum is on Skolavardhost. Uh, the entire museum is an art piece, and uh, so I will go briefly over the process and what inspired me to do the digital twin project for these statues. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I am a computer animator and a meteorologist. Got my first uh, I sort of uh, started in uh, 3D modeling in 1997, quite a while ago, quarter of a century ago. Um, and my, you know, like everybody else who has done any 3D modeling, uh, I started using uh, reference planes, which is a very time consuming process. And, uh, um, but yeah, so just to get to the, to the good stuff, uh, I received an Epic Mega Grant in 2020 to create a time machine to destroy Icelandic farms, like you do, you know? Um, and that's it for the background. Uh, I started noticing uh, uh, photogrammetry in 2006 when I was studying at Oldborg University. Um, and it was, at the time, it was purely experimental, almost theoretical uh, process only a limited to like research universities and mega servers and, and computer arrays. Um, but so when I when I started working at Apple Engineering uh, in 2010, we were already doing uh, surveying using drones and uh, and LiDAR scanners. And so uh, I was curious about, you know, if we could use this for a smaller scale objects such as statues. And it was in 2019 when I was visiting uh, in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina for an Unreal uh, Academy that I started experimenting with uh, capturing statues. And it was a very primitive setup. It was just a, a, a Samsung S20 and uh, Meshroom, the software. So it wasn't really any you know high quality uh, user-friendly process. But uh, so then, then uh, I returned to Iceland and I started uh, noticing that all around me there were statues and lots of them. And the Einar Jonsson Museum on Skolavrhost is very accessible and it has a, a 
a huge concentration of, of sculptures in one place. And uh, I've all, also, on a personal note, I've all, always been uh, really interested in the Anna Jonsson arts because it is a, a mixture of of uh, sort of a mystical, mythical, almost fantastic um, beings and, and mythology and, and everything that a, a hyper um, imaginative person needs to get inspired. Um, and so the foundation for the project was really started after I had done a number of uh, photogrammetry projects just for myself of the statues in the garden. And I was I was on winter break from school with my daughter. And so we went to visit the Anna Jonsson Museum and I had uh, Sketchfab installed on my mobile. And uh, I showed some of the statues to one of the employees at the, at the desk. And she said, you know, you should really, really show this to the museum director and gave me the, and, and her name is Almatis. And uh, so I sent Alma some links to the models, you know, telling her, you know, this is just my my personal stuff. Uh, didn't didn't know where to apply for permission to create the models, but I figured that, you know, I, I wasn't doing this for uh, professional purposes. And I said, you know, do you think that there's a um, there's a sort of foundation or a, a, is there any any way that we can can bring this to the, you know, Bring this to pe more people on via sort of uh, official channels, you know, through the through the museum. And she she told me that it just so happened that there was a, a deadline coming up to apply to Barta Menningasjöder, which is a children's culture fund in Iceland. And you know, we we should we should try putting together an application to make this an official project. And so. Just like you know, anything Icelandic, if it wasn't for the last minute, nothing would ever get done. So we managed to put together a good application, sent it in, and it got apply, uh, approved. So we got uh, we applied for a, a certain amount, and we got the full amount. So we were able to um, sort of identify ten pieces of art, and uh, you you will notice in the background I have pictures of of the artwork, and this is all three D models. So it's it none of the none of the images are of actual, you know, uh, in garden statues. These are all screen captures from Sketchfab. Uh, yeah, so so we were awarded the grant and we decided to uh, single out ten pieces from the collection to start with. And uh, so the, the 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 project was set up so that the uh, the museum staff would take gather whatever information they could find. On the statues and the process behind the statues and all this, and we would have a person narrate, um, make a narration of of uh, about the statues. And so, so Epla was uh, doing all the practical stuff of capturing the the images, processing, and post production, also with uh, video for social media and marketing purposes. And so, and 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 we also. Um, the, the idea was and is to uh, make this as a uh, art curriculum for children, you know, uh, from from the age of six uh, up until or even younger. But yeah. And so the, the process is just like any other photogrammetry process, really. Uh, we use cameras. Sometimes we have to use phones where the cameras are, you know, not practical. But, you know, with with phone cameras today, they are. I wouldn't say they're almost as good, but but they they get get enough of the job done. Uh, some of the statues are very tall. Uh, for example, the Inkolver Arnason on Arnarhot, and Jon Sigurs on on Östervöllur. So we had to use uh, uh, DJI Mavic Pro uh, for those. And since we are a, a, a licensed drone operator, we we just had to apply for a, a license to fly. In the city, and you know, we have a good relationship with Isavia, so we we usually get those licenses on fairly short notice. And uh, even though I had started using Meshroom when I start started using photogrammetry, uh, I've switched over to reality capture because I, it's a lot more powerful and and more intuitive in terms of UI, especially if you have a 3D modeling or any kind of uh, CG background. Um, 
which brings me to the, the cleanup software. I use uh, ZBrush, Photoshop, and Maya to clean. And uh, then we use, uh, at the moment, we use Sketchfab to present the models. And I will, I will leave a link at the end of the presentation. Um, but the thing is that Sketchfab is sort of like YouTube for 3D. It's, I found it um, less and less appealing in terms of, uh, especially when you have a, a, a targeted audience like school children, you don't want to have suggested models right next to the model you're working with, unless it's your own models and Sketchfab really, yeah, it's 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 a bit like YouTube. So we, we are uh, invest, investigating potential uh, platforms that also give us control of, of the content much more. And the results, of the project are that we finished on time uh, within budget. And uh, we also applied this spring for a follow up pro uh, grant to complete the scanning and the, uh, of all the inside of the museum as well as the house outside. And we just a few weeks ago, we were told that we would get the grant. And so this summer, we are. Uh, just gearing up to make, uh, to start the project. And some of the lessons that we learned from this project, especially, you know, when, when you have the, um, uh, sort of the, 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 the challenges like any, any, any other project in Iceland, the challenge is the weather. And weirdly enough, whenever I would go out to capture the statues, the sun would come out. So I think the weather, uh, people should pay me to go out, uh, you know, to do photogrammetry projects in order to get good weather. It always it's always sunny when I go out. It's kind of weird. Um, it also surprised me how many trees there are in Reykjavik, especially around statues. It was a, a bit of a challenge sometimes to get the, especially when you had to use a drone uh, to get the drone to an angle, um, good enough angle to to get good shots of the of the statues. Uh, in terms of uh, user instructions, it, I really can't uh, overstate the, the importance of getting, you know, the actual user testing done. In, because the what you think is uh, logical, it may not seem logical to a six-year-old or or a teacher or a parent or whoever is going to be showing the the results or the project to the user. Uh, it's also important to to realize that uh, if you didn't build the platform yourself, you will like the Sketchfab platform, for example. They will they can change it with short notice or no notice. And we had uh, with Sketchfab, we were unfortunately we had to disable the audio because well, Sketchfab disabled the audio because uh, some users had been uploading copyrighted material as audio to their models. So they shut the audio off for everybody, which sort of drives us to test uh, other platforms. And that also um, will probably work out better in the end. Um, it also, I can't, I know that most people in this, in this audience that are coming from the museums, you will know that you are definitely understaffed and underfunded. And we need to uh, um, find ways to pressure municipalities, private groups, governments to see the value in you know 21st century technology. And COVID really showed how uh, uh, remote museums can, can uh, um, help. Uh, so uh, just to leave you with, with an overview of the statues. So these are actually uh, 14 statues that four extra ones that are, that are uh, not necessarily a part of the project, but they're all available. And if you if you go to this link, sketchfab.com, list us up in us, you will see, uh, you will, you can see those statues and they're, they're fairly high resolution. Um, yeah, and I think that's, that's it for me. Uh, if there are any questions from the audience about the process, how we did it, uh, I would be happy to tell you about if you want to reach out uh, about the Mega Grant project from Epic Games. They have a huge war chest from uh, from their uh, 
incredible income model and they they support all kinds of projects um, uh, yeah so any questions from the audience well see about that if you stop sharing yes but thank you Thrasher. So, well, we have one here at least. Okay. That's a good trick here. Okay, this is really incredible work, Thrastir. Um, Thank you. Here. Um, so each statue is almost like a, an entire landscape. Uh, you yes. know, it, there's a lot of detail in his work. And you feel, mm -hmm. and, and you're thinking, I'm immediately thinking that there's a whole guided tour around a single statue. Did you actually, mm -hmm. uh, so your audio recording and uh, sort of the, yeah, the background audio was that recorded with a travel in around the statue in mind or did you create like a guided tour like into certain details because there's a lot of like different things going on uh, yeah. for a single statue yes so so what we did originally was uh, uh the staff believe it or not there's really little information on Enar Jonsson and his and his work like he really didn't like talking about himself and and uh, so this so the museum special staff were really uh having a hard time um getting that uh all the, well, well making it more you know audio interesting so so we had to kind of leave it up to people like we had a um a study guide that was created for for the statues with some questions you know what about the um sort of what 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 is the story going on in the statue who are the especially when you had like the mytho, myth uh what is it called myth, mythological characters uh how, how can you relate that to you know back to the norse mythology or the greek and uh so for this second uh what we're going to do in the second part of the project is we're going to work with uh uh not the ministry of education but the uh, directorate of, ed of uh, education mental molestopman we have some spe uh, some uh, study material editors there that are going to help us with uh, the art and uh, history aspect of making it more immersive and uh, because they 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 have a lot more um, experience in making sort of immersive uh, study materials and uh, and any suggestions uh, absolutely you know shoot them my way either through LinkedIn or T H T at flap.is. Uh, also, uh, when I'm back in Iceland, I'd be happy to meet with people that have uh, suggestions or input or comments or, or anything. It's a, it's a work in progress, and I feel that it's gonna it's gonna sort of open open more eyes towards how we can remotely uh, access these these statues. It's a good good uh, yeah. good good question. Thank you. Any more questions? Any questions online? No one raising hand there. So, but <clears throat> just thank you for this. Thursday. This was All right. thank this, you. Uh, this is a work in, work in progress and a very interesting one and shows us all how much you can actually do and bring some artworks that not so many actually go to see to a new life digitally. But yeah, give him a hand again. To make some oh, noise. Oh, just, 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 just one, one extra note that I just remembered, uh, because I don't want to remember it when the next presentation is started. It's been really interesting in in uh, merging this technology with art because it is uh, 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 sort of. I think it's a really promising platform. Definitely is. Definitely is. Well, next we will take to the outer hybrids, and uh, that's Rebecca Rennell and. Emily, wasn't it? Emily Gull. And, uh, and we have to find the presentation. Here. We go. Well, right. Yeah. Use the remote. 
Yeah. Audience okay. gallery. Okay, lovely. So, Thanks very much. Okay, uh, my name is Becky Renell. Uh, I'm an archaeologist from uh, UHI Outer Hebrides, and I'm based in Uist, which is a small island. Um, and this is my colleague, Emily Gow. And today we're going to talk to you a little bit about our project, uh, the UIST Virtual Archaeology Project. And this is a digital archaeology interpretation project. So I'm going to talk a little bit at the beginning about how the project came about, how we got where we are today, some of the challenges that we have with our archaeology. Um, and then I'm going to pass over to Emily, who's going to expand on all the lovely detail of things that we've been doing. And finally, I think we'll finish up with just some initial reflections um, since the launch of our app, um, which is the kind of key output of this project. Okay, if I click this, Ooh, next, here we go. Uh, so, uh, for those of you who don't know where the Outer Hebrides are, so this is a group of islands, an archipelago on the west coast of Scotland, and the area that we work in, and that what I'll be talking about today, is this chain here, which we know as Uist, which comprises North Uist, then Becula, and South Uist. And landscape, as you'll see, is really quite important to where we work. Uh, so, the, the starting point really is that Uist has absolutely amazing archaeological heritage. We've got sites of local, national, and international significance. Here are just two. I could talk literally for days about how amazing the archaeology is. On the screen here, we have Barpalangus, which is a Neolithic chamber tomb. Um, and on the right here, we have Cochalan, which is a Bronze Age site, which we'll be coming back to, which is um, probably one of our best known and most iconic, iconic sites. So we're really lucky because most of these sites have been exceptionally well uh, researched and they've been really widely published. So here we've just got an example of some of the fantastic publications. Um, however, um, although we've got all this excellent research that's been carried out, we've got, um, we've got a place where the archaeological resources are relatively poorly understood um, by our local community and they're really poorly communicated to our visitor uh, public, visiting public. Um, so really what we're, what we're looking at is an archaeological resource that's been really underexploited in terms of community benefits, visitor experience, and this huge potential that we have to tell fantastic stories about the past. Um, so what we've wanted to do with this project is really um, respond to this. We want to share stories, we want to enrich experiences, and we really want to enhance our local economy. So how do we go about doing that? So first of all, we started looking at what the challenges were. So one of the first challenges that we have in these beautiful islands is one of accessibility. Lots of our archaeological sites are in places that are largely inaccessible. They can be in places that are difficult to get to. So here is an island, an islet broch, that's quite difficult to get to. Uh, but we also have tons and tons of archaeology that's inaccessible because it's hard to find and hard to see. So uh, on the other side of the picture there, or the slide there, we've got some buried archaeological remains on the mapper. So another huge challenge that we have is there's really, really, really limited heritage infrastructure where we are. Um, only a handful of our sites actually have any kind of signage whatsoever. And you'll see from the slide here, two examples, those who are familiar with Scotland and Scotland's signage will notice that this one here in the middle is fairly dated. Um, uh, and we also have the kind of problems that we see here, which is somebody, that's that site at Hallan of international significance and someone's camping there in the middle of it. So this is a problem for us. We also have really fragile landscapes. We have huge erosion issues. This is a huge eroding prehistoric mitten at site called Balasha. And here we have uh, our Hebridean Way, which is the walking route that we refer to in this project. And the posts are just literally falling into the sea. So what do we do about this? So the starting point really was to stop whinging about all the things that made it difficult um, and try and look at our challenges instead as opportunities. Um, so what have we got? Uh, we first of all need to recognise that our archaeology looks really different from, say, Orkney, which is the place that we often find ourselves, for good or bad, comparing ourselves to. Um, our archaeological remains aren't upstanding. However, we've got really rich archaeological landscapes. We've got absolutely incredible preservation. Um, we've got loads of buried remains. And there's this potential to have a huge sense of discovery. So the challenge is... How to, how to convey this really rich story of the past when we've got largely invisible remains on the ground, um, say for just a few pile of stones. And so this is where this has presented us with the opportunity to look to some technological solutions to try and be more innovative and more imaginative and creative in how to do that. So this is where the US Virtual Archaeology Project started in 2020, uh, nicely timed for a pandemic. 
Um, uh, the project is a partnership with our local council, with the Corley and then Ellen Shear. Um, and uh, we are very happy and lucky to be partnered with, uh, sorry, funded by Nature Scotland's Natural and Cultural Heritage Fund, which is the RDF funding, um, and also Heritage Lottery, the council itself, and our local estate, Storis Wished. Um, so our funders have a real interest in heritage, which is great, because so do we. Our funders also have a real interest in the natural landscape. Um, and so these things have all really come out in this project, some of the core themes. So we've been working with a fantastic development team called Peel Interactive, um, and we've created Uist Unearthed, and this is a cross-platform mobile app, um, which has AR reconstructions of five sites on the Hebridean Way. Um, and then very recently, as in about 10 days ago, we launched our mixed media exhibition, which reflects on uh, wider aspects of the project, which we'll talk about. So hopefully I kind of set the scene of why we're here and why we're doing this, and I'm going to ask Emily to talk about all the fantastic detail. Yeah, thanks, Becky. Okay, um, I'm going to use this. Uh, yeah, so this is what the app looks like, just to give you a bit of a run through uh, when you open it. So there's a really important opportunity here, as we mentioned briefly, to enhance some existing visitor infrastructure that we have here, which Becky mentioned, that's the Hebridean Way, which runs from the very southern tip of the Outer Hebrides all the way up to the northern tip of Lewis. And using this routeway, we're starting to tell the story of Uist over 4,000 years, prehistory and history, through two really key landscape themes. That's living on the Macha in South Uist, and living in the, on water in North Uist, because we've got this really diverse landscapes here. And Macha, for those who may be less familiar, it's this low-lying sandy uh, grassy plain on the west side of the, the Outer Hebrides. And this, the sites are then right, roughly chronological order, which is really nice. So much of the users of the Hebway will travel south to north. So you start in the Bronze Age and you work your way up to the medieval and the Lord of the Isles, which is really nice. And within this app, we've got this map interface you can see here, which signposts other heritage sites as well. So not just the ones we've covered. So just signposting and starting to get some more joined up thinking and promotion there as well. And to illustrate some of the stuff we've done, I'm just going to use Clochallan as an example. This is South Uris on the West Coast. And we mentioned that several times before. It's a Bronze Age site. This is what it looks like today. So you can see there's three, three uh, conjoined huts there. Uh, and the, that's the interpretation. So some panels, they used to be up on posts and some cows used on the scratching uh, posts. So now they're knocked down and they're on the floor. They're quite faded, the information is good, but there's clearly something that we could do here. And it's been really extensively excavated as many of our sites have been, this is by the University of Sheffield. So that's what it, it looked like under excavation in the nineties and, and, and early and late eighties as well. And it's a much smaller part of a, of a wider settled landscape. And we argue that these sites are best understood in their landscape context. And a key aim of ours has been to really encourage engagement with place throughout this, this project and all the work and all the outputs we make. So resultantly, although anyone can download the app, and I encourage you to do so if you're interested, it's free to download, um, to get that full um, augmented reality experience of the life-size reconstructions of these sites along the Hebridean Way, you, you have to be at the site, each of the sites where there's a QR code, that's the QR code there, embedded in our logo, and you bring that up that way. Uh, so it's really important to us that these heritage assets actually cannot just be accessed from anywhere. For the full experience, we want people to go to US and understand and, and get the context, the landscape context of these sites. And so using AR, what we've done is essentially we're revealing these sites, these hidden, these buried sites, uh, which, are, which are hidden either conceptually or, or physically. And that's what it looks like in the app. So that's a uh, that's Halland there when you scan the code and all the reconstructions, they're really meticulously researched. And again, based on all these, these decades of excavations that we have here. And I won't go into this in too much detail, but just to say that another opportunity we had here was to, to really embed the Gallic language in an innovative and sensitive way as well um, uh, as the language of the region. It's really important there, but happy to answer any questions. I won't go into it too much uh, on how, how we did that. Um, and, and here's another view. So this is, again, this is it here. So you can see we've got this life-size reconstruction um, all, all based on the archaeological evidence. Lots of discussion, lots of back and forth between ourselves as archaeologists, the developer team, the modelers, and then the, the original excavators as well. So it's really interesting from a research point of view, understanding how we use space. And you can see a few of these blue dots. Each one of those triggers information, multi-layered information, whether that's audio, text, or images. And that was really important to us. I think on the broad scale, we've got two main audiences. We've got our visitors and communities, but it's really important to know that within that, there's a huge amount of nuance, different audiences want different things and they're not monoliths. So we wanted to explore our audiences and what they needed as much as possible. So we used a variety of media 
to communicate some quite complex archaeological data. So this is a still from an animation we created, which tells the story of the mummified remains from Clachalan. And then we also use things like illustration to, to show the deep phasing. You know, this is a this is millennia of, of occupation at this site. So using a series of illustrations to show that as well, lots of infographics, things like that, to talk about place names and understand the, the composite bodies and things like that, as well as bespoke models and photogrammetry models as well. So real mixed media going on here. And this is just, uh, that was Harlan. So this is just a sneak peek, really. This is the site that we're, we're launching now. This is Viking Bornish, the longhouse there. And this is a rendering of, of our, our model, our life-size model put on top of a, a very sunny looking, beautiful US. That is a real photo. It does sometimes look like that, but this is what it often looks like as well. So this is in the app, a bit more overcast. So that's a screenshot from the AR. Um, and then during our, our beta testing, and since the launch last year, we've had some really useful feedback that we've been able to implement, which has been really important. And again, I don't have much time to go into this, but I just wanted to flag as well that we've been able to do a huge amount of co-production and collaboration over the last few months, which is slightly hindered by COVID. As we come out, we've started to be able to do a lot more from school groups to historical societies as well, creating photogrammetry models, creating animations with them, lots of testing, recording US voices. Um, and we've been evaluating since the start and that's just a few thoughts there, uh, mostly very positive. My favorite is this final quote here. I think a few people have touched on this in, in some of the keynotes. Um, so after we finished the app, we played around the site pretending to be the inhabitants of the brown houses. So it prompted imaginative play here. So it's what happens after you finish using the app, what happens next? And can we start changing actions or, or prompting different actions and behaviors? And I'll hand over to you oh, yeah. to talk a bit about this. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our uh, multimedia exhibition. As I said, I think at the beginning, this is really new, only launched 10 days ago. Um, and really this was an opportunity for us to bring in um, to showcase the content from our app, some of the content for wider audiences. And it's a traveling exhibition, so it will go around and we can take it to other places. Um, it's comprised mainly of this beautiful graphic that Emily's already shown you, the real landscape augmented with this really accurate model of the longhouse, the Viking longhouse of Bornish. And we were also delighted to, the other day to realize that when we went to the settlement museum to see the reconstructions there and just how similar and feeling very connected, which was really lovely. Um, we also have in our exhibition, we have three interactive screens where you can engage in different information, stories, artifacts, 3D models. Um, uh, and we also have uh, some actual 3D printed artifacts. We've played around with the colors here because they're not real. We've made them quite wacky, silly colors relating to our branding. We're really keen and interested to know whether people think that's, that works or whether that's maybe a bit daft. Um, we also have this interactive, which is assemble a mummy. Um, a Bronze Age mummy with magnetic pieces, and that seems to be fairly popular with kids. Um, and finally, the kind of um, the real showstopper seems to be our VR headsets, which is again reusing um, our models from the AR app um, on, a, on a, a VR headset. Um, and one of the lovely things that we're finding already, ten days in, but um, early days, but that this really appeals to quite a diverse audience. So of all age groups seem to really enjoy it. Oh, I'll keep talking about back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> back again, double act. So yeah, I'll just end with some initial reflections about user data and what we're seeing. We've had over 2000 downloads since we launched last year. And when you look at the QR codes and scans and the initial user data, it looks like some people are spending up to 28 minutes of use at these sites, which I think is really important because we spend a lot of time at these sites and you sort of see people, they'll come over, they'll kind of dutifully look at the, the interpretation board for a minute and then they'll carry on walking. So people are spending time at these sites they're getting inside the houses, they're ducking and crouching to get in them and just engaging with the sites a whole lot more and for longer. And that has important implications, I think, for things like stopping and spending and spending longer in US. And in terms of content, who, what people are looking at, it looks like they, they're using the northernmost house and the mummies the most. They find that more interesting or is it because it's nearer to the QR code and they're already so blown away by the initial life-size reconstruction that actually then they, they just focus on one house. Um, other reflections, probably too much content. I think we were very excited. There's so many stories to tell from all these sites because there's been so much excavation. So we wanted to tell all the stories. And actually, I think that there's a, a big argument for scaling that back a little bit. Um, and generally, a lot of the, in terms of what people are looking at, they seem to be enjoying more talking to people, the, the animations, the illustrations, the audio, rather than the the, the bespoke sort of 3D models and the photogrammetry models. It's, it's more about the, the very visual things that they seem to be enjoying more, uh, which is quite interesting. 
and I've highlighted a lot of positives, but I think it's important to also highlight some of the challenges we've we faced with this. And many of these are inherently linked to the fact that we're really pushing the technology here and its capabilities. We've been really ambitious and this, is really, this has been met uh, with real determination by our, uh, by our developer team, PL Interactive, they've been brilliant. Uh, meeting our vision, then there's been a lot of back and forth on that. But some of the things are things like 4G connectivity in rural areas um, and the time consuming AR alignment process as well at these sites. And although it leaves no trace in the landscape, which is a major bonus for our funders and the things that they're, they're concerned with, that the technology is not without its, its maintenance obligations. And that's a consideration as we go forward and beyond the life of our funding as well, what, what happens to these assets afterwards. And then finally, just to touch on concepts of authenticity quickly, I think as archaeologists, this is something we've historically been quite concerned with, what is authentic, and that, thinking about those 3D printed artifacts as well. And we've been playing a lot with that concept of authenticity. And there's that real tension there between our desire for what we perceive to be authentic and actually creating a valuable experience for our users and our, and, and our audiences. So that's been a really important consideration that we're always thinking about. And uh, just to finish off with this photo, this kind of sums up the, the project in a while, you know, in, in a way, in very basic terms, what we've done is upgrade the, the interpretation facility for those who want it. And it takes what we're doing beyond the interpretation panel. But what we're also doing here is promoting this active engagement with these sites and injecting a bit more energy and, um, and activity within them. We want people to go and touch them and look at them and crawl around in them. And finally, we see this initial project as the proof of the concept. We, we have this initial funding commitment now from our local authority to extend the project to across the Western Isles, the rest of the Western Isles, uh, while always reflecting on what we've been doing for the last three years and what we can, we can do differently next time. I'll just take a minute to thank our funders. And finally, yes, if you want to learn more, we've got the app, it's, it's live now. There is initial information if you can't get to us that you can download. Uh, those are our, our, our handles, email addresses. And also we have got our VR headsets here with these reconstructions as well, if anyone would like to have a look in the coffee break. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. That was really interesting. And, uh, Beth, we have some questions after all this. Thruster has a question. Yes, thank you for the presentation. It looked really nice. Can you can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yes, they can hear you. Okay, perfect. Uh, so so the uh, QR app is that a proprietary app, or did you did you buy it or? How how was that process? I've been I've been looking into this and not finding uh, one that I liked, but this one looked good. Uh, if I think you I've understand you, I, I know that there are some apps and and programs that you that are kind of copy paste that you can you can move and, and templates that you can use on multiple sites, multiple projects. But this this app was created bespoke for us by Peel Interactive, so it's a it's a brand new app rather than a, a template. If, if that's what it's from scratch. So oh yeah, made from scratch. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. More questions? Yeah. Hmm? Hannes? I'm also very curious about how you interact with your customers once you got the app. You seem to show some data about their behavior. Like you actually scan this code. Do you get notified or it's logged or something? So when you distribute these things across the entire uh, region, are you going to be able to track their travels and see like where you go? I, I'm not like, no, I mean, there's yeah. a the danger there, but, but it might, might also be very exciting. Yeah. If someone actually commits. Uh, yeah. If they, yeah. If they commit. If they permit it, yeah, I suppose uh, so. It doesn't take any personal data. It just is sort of user one or user six hundred did this, um, and that's all it can tell. But yeah, there probably would be opportunities to see whether they use a yeah, if they single go, site. I think we can do that. We can we can find out if the same person or the same phone has been to every single site and how long they've spent in each one, yeah. and whether they therefore implies they like one more than another or that kind of thing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. No, I think that there's a lot of information that's going to be able to pull out about mm -hmm. how people use it. Yeah, but definitely. we're also finding from going and observing people that's oh, actually yeah. been really telling. Is that lots of times when we've got one single user, it's about five people together, yeah, it's a family, it's yeah, all together. Yeah. Yeah. So, so actually, that user data does need supplementing with some kind of like on-site observation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, really interesting. 
Yeah. 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 Yeah, because you watch people and you can see they're getting really, because AR we think of not being yeah. fully immersive, but you can see them going like this and yeah, going inside the houses because they're very low doors. People kind of shouting because they think they've got too close to the fire yeah. and then you know they're fully immersed. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so thank you. This is really, yes, the augmented reality is something that I think we are stepping just into a totally new field of informative uh, interpretation and uh, on site just and yeah I, I love I love thinking about AR and all the all the possible things but uh, this session I mean this session has so many aspects and uh, now we are going to hear from Hannes Agne Wilhelmsson a professor at the Reykjavik University and also a founder of the Anvalis uh, about if you can use the AI or the artificial intelligence in some ways to this. So should we try to share this? Yeah, I'll take over uh, from here. Yep. Um, so you just have to just... You... So, oh no, we still have the echo. Okay. Interesting. Hello? Yeah. Oh. Okay, then I uh, hear it online. So, thruster. Can you hear me, thruster? No, I hear you good. Yeah, but I saw the echo. I saw the echo here. Are they better than a little bit? I guess that's the line on now. Yeah. Oh, nice. All right. Okay, so I'm with recording. Volume selected. And I can share my screen here. Great. Now we move it to that screen. I'll do this first. Okay. So now you should see my screen here. And I can. Okay. This is okay. You can see my slide here, and uh, you can see it here in this room. Trust that you will just speak up if you can't, if something is wrong. Okay. So. My name is Hannes Agnilansson. I'm a professor at, in uh, computer science at Reykjavik University, so I'm not from the archaeology or history. Um, uh, and I'm also the co-founder of Envalis, uh, which I'll introduce in a moment. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the procedural generation, which is an approach to generating these environments uh, somewhat autonomously. Uh, and I'll talk about how that can help us with some of these issues. But I must say that you know, for the purists that the procedural generation approaches, they do not create an accurate representation of a lot of things. So they don't really, you know, I know about that, those flaws, but let's think about other strengths uh, from this approach. And uh, first some acknowledgements, uh, this is a uh, work that I'm presenting here as part of a larger uh, project. Uh, there's a large team of people behind it and it's been uh, funded by the Icelandic Research Fund and the Icelandic Technical Development Fund. Um, in particular, some techniques I'll be going over have been developed by uh, my er uh, former students, Hörður, Maur, and Unnar, uh, who are doing a master's uh, degree at Reykjavik University, but now work and have worked at Envalis. I'm also uh, mentioning at the end work by my PhD student, Mikl Um, But also the whole project that I'll be talking about is coordinating par partnership uh, with uh, Dr. Patl Liapuk Limtar, who's an environmental psychologist. 
And he decided to team up with a computer scientist uh, so to develop new methods and tools to improve urban design. So that's actually where we are coming from. A uh, quick overview, I'm actually going through four different cases or sort of projects that tie into a bit of a story about how procedural, procedural generation can help us. Um, so let's just start with a little bit of introduction to the project that I'm referring to, which is called the Cities That Sustain Us Project. Um, and this project is using virtual reality to study how the design of urban environments impacts people psychologically before these environments are built. Because we all know the experience of walking into a new neighborhood and getting kind of depressed immediately because the walls are too high, things are dark, there's no, hardly any sun, whatever. Whatever reason it is, we get a feeling that is not necessarily a good feeling. We want to spot these things ahead of time. And so putting people into a VR experience of future plans is an important step. Um, this has been a research collaboration between multiple partners in 2014, between the Reykjavik University, Uppsala University, both computer science and psychology departments have been involved, in, including also at the Institute for Housing and Urban Research at Uppsala, and also local uh, design consulting and research companies here in Reykjavik, as well as some collaboration with municipalities like Reykjavik City. Um, all of this, this whole project has led to the founding of a company, kind of a startup from all of this, which is bringing all of these tools that we have been developing and methods to use VR to, to study psychology um, into real world urban planning and design projects. So this is a bit of a, a blurb about the, the frame, framework of what I'm talking about here. So in the beginning of this project, we had the need of creating uh, urban environments for us to study specific impacts of specific architectural features on people. Um, so, for example, if we want to study the height of a building on the well being of a person, we needed to create buildings of different heights and we needed to create different streets uh, where there was a certain, let's say, a ratio uh, between different heights in that street. So this called for the creation of a procedural, we call it procedural city, which is essentially an algorithmically generated city. We just specify the city we want, and we press the generate button, and the city appear, appears. Um, and this uh, we managed to create, uh, which allowed us to do things like this. We create, create the same exact city. This is actually these two pictures here. But the, this is the same exact city, except that we have um, just flipped a few features around. So you will think, see things like the decorations of the roofs are all gone in, the, in one version of the city. The only difference here is a very simple configuration. These cities had to be generated in enough detail that you could experience them in virtual reality. You would you know, go into the streets, in VR goggles in our lab, and then go around the city um, while we recorded your physiology, uh, heart rate, for example, blood pressure. Uh, we also had some questions that you were asked before and after, and there's a whole lot of uh, methodology around how we measure the well being uh, of the person. But this was working really well, uh, this uh, procedural approach. We could actually see, we could create um, responses, psychological responses with these creations. So that's all well and good in the research laboratory. Um, and just to tell you a little bit about how these cities are generated, this is basically the entire city is divided into small tiles, uh, square tiles. Um, each square tile can grow a building uh, according to the parameters we give it, how high the building is, what color it is, uh, how it's decorated, and so on. And then all of those tiles are collected into an entire city, uh, and there are some placement rules about how the tiles can interact in that entire scene. Um, and this is the data that goes into creating a whole city. I mean, all of you could easily do this, and we kind of joke, actually, that Hout uh, was working on the project uh, with me, of course, 
he created this image in Excel using the cells in Excel and coloring them. So that way he could create an entire street layout that you see uh, on, over here where the streets are white and the buildings are blue and the parks are green. And then more detail can be added, basically information about how each tile should be as layers on top of the layout. Um, each layer will give you more information like what color of the building is there, uh, how high is the building, what kind of decoration is shown in front of the building and uh, what kind of roof are on the building. So with only these five images, pressing the generate button generates the city. It's a very large city and now I'm zooming way back, but if you go into the detail, you can zoom in to the street level and because this is all built for VR, where you're standing in first person on the ground and looking around yourself. And you will see that in this map here, these little orange dots, and those are locations that you have to visit. And we actually solve the locomotion problem using uh, teleportation. So you actually see the next stop and you point at it and you hold the trigger and you move uh, kind of quickly, like just a, like a jump. To the next spot and then in some of these spots we also have um, kiosks virtual kiosks um, where you answer some questions about how you're feeling uh, and what you think about your surroundings and so on we also have audio as an integral part of this so the whole environment uh, is a multi kind of multimodal experience or multi-sensory experience although we don't have the scent yet we'd love to have that so during these travels to the environment we can measure people's reactions and we can use that as data uh, and then we can alter the environment pretty easily. So this, was, uh, this is very good, again, as a part of a research lab. Um, but then we had one research question that was very important to us because we are measuring all of these uh, psychological responses in a VR created artificial environment. How do we know that measuring psychological impact in VR will tell us anything about how you'll react in the real world? This, this problem here or experiment, uh, which is, can we then, you know, put you put up put participants into the, the same exact psychological experiment in the real world and virtual and VR and compare the results? So we could actually calibrate or calibrate um, our VR measuring tools um, using real-world data that we're getting from the real world. So in order to carry out this experiment, we were now faced with the problem of recreating a real street in Reykjavik in VR so that we could make the measurements in both. Um, our procedural city framework that I just introduced to you definitely did not work here. There are no straight tiles in Reykjavik. I mean, there's nothing very uh, square about uh, this street that you see here. Reykjavik City actually uh, gave us this street and the next street over in Voabil to do this. And you can see how, how crowded and, and sort of un, or not square this is, organic, let's say. Um, we considered maybe creating a VR version of this street that was sort of modeled after like a Google Street View type of thing or a 360 type of VR or something like that. So we just use the imagery that already existed from those streets. But as you all know, that's not really the same as a VR experience. Uh, there are a lot of limitations to using the static images, uh, let's say like from a street view. Um, this readily available things were not in, in depth uh, or in 3D uh, at that time at least. And there's no free movement, like just moving your head around is a weird experience if the whole environment moves with you. Um, also, with those approaches that are basically image-based then, um, it's hard to remove things and replace them or adjust things, uh, which we do need when we are doing a psychological experiment, we need to control for certain things. And if something is just too disturbing, we need to remove it from that imagery. Also, weather and lighting, um, we wanted to make sure that we had the same amount of bad weather in the VR and the real world. And we had no control, obviously, of the real world. So we had to control this in the VR world so that we would match. Um, and that was something we could not use with imagery. 
So our solution was modeling everything by hand. So we just took, we took the architectural drawings of every building in the neighborhood. We built them from scratch, uh, bottom up and, and decorated the environment. It came out pretty well. Uh, it was a pretty good replica, even if the, the lighting is not exactly the same here, but we did actually get it pretty, pretty close. But one year of work. This is two streets in Reykjavik. So, uh, well, we got, we got good results. I mean, actually, they, we have not published the paper yet, but it's on the way, uh, which actually, the conclusions of the research are good. There is a correspondence between VR and the real world. Um, but more on that maybe sometime later. So, uh, but things, the projects come in, and one of the next projects that we looked at was, and in fact, there's a real world planning project going on in this town of Djupivor in east of Iceland. They uh, approached us uh, to do some kind of a, a VR study of how people would experience a future plan that they were considering. And now, just after having done one street in one year, we were kind of rattled and they said, yeah, just, this is just one town, right? Um, so how could we possibly, we, there was no way that we would do the, we'd be able to do the same thing that we did with uh, Warbase. So what we did was that we commissioned a, pro, uh, a scanning company, Svarmi here in Iceland, that does drone scanning of large environments. Um, and they were happy to help and they produced amazing scan of the entire town. Really cool. Um, and this picture you're seeing here, this is just from their scan with all the depth information in there. And so you can really fly around and experience that uh, in 3D, just like that. But there were challenges with this data, like all of you are familiar with, I'm sure. Um, well, first of all, the model we got from them was one gigabyte of size. So most of our computers couldn't even open the file that we got from them. But um, but that was just one of the problems. I mean, there's a, there were some distortions, as you also know, uh, especially when you get down to detail. And here are some buildings that don't look like buildings anymore uh, after the scanning. So probably what you would have to do would to scan every single building, like some of, again, some of you have done. Um, but everything is static. Uh, this is a single point in time that everything is captured, particular weather, uh, particular locations of cars and people and weird things that you may not want in there in the end. So there is, uh, and it's very hard to modify. Uh, so one of the things that the town wanted us to do was to look at a future plan that didn't exist. And so how would you incorporate that into this? But we were, we faced this and said, okay, this is still a good place to start. Uh, we, the model was cleaned up, uh, things were trimmed out. And also the area was uh, shrunken uh, a little bit around the downtown. Um, so this was a starting point for manual 3D modeling that then came on top. Now, even after we then replaced the buildings uh, with correct 3D models, so they were not distorted anymore. So we see here uh, a building uh, that actually is a 3D model placed where the real, real building was. We noticed another thing, and that was the natural elements um, they were not in sufficient detail for VR. Standing in that drone captured imagery uh, shows us a very blurry ground like this one here. And this could be a bit distracting, uh, even if the buildings were nice. So we started uh, adding a lot of natural detail by hand, planting rocks, planting uh, vegetation where it was expected it to be. And things started looking really good up close. And uh, that's what we got. Uh, we got a whole town eventually, uh, which looked like this. Uh, so it's a little bit more like a game environment, I suppose. There's a lot of 3D models, but still on top of the original scan. And things look uh, really, really nice. But again, this was a six month process um, of, of of getting the scan and then getting these details in there for the town of Dupuyord. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna show you this environment in, in real time. I'll maybe show it to you later, but I'm gonna move on. Now, 
Then we have the, this, so these are all within a research project. These are all proofs of concept. So these are, uh, and, and, and I should tell you though that the Duke project was tremendously successful in, uh, in, in explaining the plans to the local inhabitants. We took the VR experience there and everyone just had a completely different uh, view of what was going to happen. And uh, they were incredibly appreciative of this effort, but that's all within the research project. We then wanted to apply this to planning projects that had strict time and budget constraints. Now we're just starting this here. We need this well, you know, next week or whatever. Um, and this company, this Envalis company was supposed to service all of that. So how can we re react to these constraints? Since we know this thing takes uh, at least six months. Can we go procedural again? Because remember, it was very easy to make that big city uh, with procedural approaches. So Enval has created uh, a tool called VR Terrain. So it's a terrain generator for mostly, but a bit more maybe. It can generate 3D terrain from maps and layers, a little bit like that um, procedural city that we had earlier. It grows the elements uh, according to various rules that we give it. Uh, about things that you know grow higher up or things that grow lower further down, uh, things like uh, different slopes and things like that, and what happens around roads and the coastlines and all of that. Um, and then on top of that, of course, um, you can add 3D models. Uh, this is all done inside Unity, so you just generate this, and then you can use Unity to place whatever you want on top of this um, as you want. But there's also this capability that it grows buildings um, from the ground uh, plane or the perimeters of those buildings. It's basically extruded from the ground. Um, I hope I have a, a moment. I'm, like, I'm gonna see if I can now, uh, how this goes. I'm gonna see our sound and I'm gonna optimize for video. And because this is always the tricky part where I want to show you something in real time. And don't worry, every single file here is called Dupivore, but it's not Dupivore. Um, so here, actually, let me start here. Um, so this is a project uh, where some people were interested in how, what it would look like if you uh, create a road crossing across this uh, fjord here. And they wanted to see what is it like on the ground. But this is the data that you get. You get like a really far up uh, kind of a, a top down view. And VR terrain was then able to take that data and generate, of course, uh, like the, the mountains around it. Uh, from height uh, data. And, but the interesting thing about VR train is that you can go all the way down to the asphalt on the street itself. Um, and there are some birds there, flying there. It is live. Um, there are cars driving. And there are some buildings that have been extruded from where they are in their correct sites. But here is an example of something that where part of it is reflecting uh, the actual like landscape and a part of it is actually is a is a, is a proposal that is simply introduced as a piece of data that then generates this this interactive imagery. Um, and I'm just going to give you one more example of a which probably also is called Jupiter. But let's see. Ah, yeah, I knew it. <laughs> but this is Plantos. Um, where, which shows you an example of this generated environment plus a 3D model that is in higher detail. And I'm gonna just go down here. So the mountains in the background, uh, the trees and the grass that you're seeing, uh, those are all the elements that are just automatically added. And these white buildings um, in the distance and over here, they are automatically generated from the data from those houses. But obviously this house is not automatically generated. 
This is a, a proposed reconstruction of, uh, of an old, um, I think, uh, electric station or uh, power station um, into a museum, turning it into a museum. And you can explore different designs of it. And you can go inside and you can see a lot of detail. So what I'm showing is basically our VR train engine is creating all of the surroundings. And then you stick your uh, main thing in, inside that, into that context, and you can experience it uh, seamlessly. Like the nature is there outside the window and it's uh, all there. So I'm gonna go out of this again and come back to this and, and to So, um, and for the last project, so I have not told you anything. Uh, whoop. Oh my God, zoom quick. Is it really? Let me just say, I may have lost people there. I see zoom here. Um, here we go. Connecting again automatically. Okay, we are back, right? Thurston, can you confirm that you're back? Uh, we are back. Yes, I can see you. Okay, perfect. Thank I, you. I, can't see, I can't see your screen though, but I can see no, you. No, no, I'll see it again. Just uh, the slides will come back. Okay. And um, so our, I didn't say anything about how long this took, uh, these environments that I just showed you, uh, but we did a little bit of an experiment with Isafjörður, which is a town in the West Fjords. And we wanted a very quick turnaround. And this is the data that went into VR terrain, uh, color map from above is a photograph from above. We have height information. So here's the mountain actually, it's very tall, but you also have the details around the houses over here. And then uh, you can quickly draw a coastline from this map here and the roads can be extracted also. This data then generated this. And we did a little bit of, putting in 3D elements like this, light poles, uh, putting some cars in and things like that. So how long do you think this took one person? Two days. And the, and the, the entire town of Isafjord, which is actually much larger than this, uh, but you can fly around it and explore it in this kind of detail, but obviously the houses are all white boxes, but you can go in and replace those and you can do things uh, differently if you want. Uh, so I might have time to show you this later, but let's see if we can just move on. Because I want, how are we on time? Is it? It's over. Yeah, so let me just talk a little bit about the social uh, AI because, um, so from this, what you're seeing here is a very good way of quickly getting a, a 3D basis for your further work. Um, but then how do you, they're all desolate, they're all, void of people or anything you can interact with. One of the hardest things that we, you know, we saw this already today, right? Uh, is to bring people into or characters into these worlds. And uh, here again, some automation can help. Um, you're probably familiar with characters that just do always the same thing over and over again because someone found a very nice animation loop or a captured, motion captured loop of someone performing the same action over and over again. That is just a playback of an animation. But what if you're now introducing an interactive element where someone can come in and maybe interact with them, these, these people? Or if these people come in touch with each other, should they interact in ways that are not necessarily predetermined? So we have been working on a social pedestrian model uh, for cities like this. Uh, where we pretty much just paint into the model what are walkable areas and uh, desirable areas for people to spend time on and where they should 
you know, not necessarily, they can still cross four roads, but they would rather find a, a, a crosswalk to walk across. And I'm gonna show you, just end with a video. Um, and I know it's a bit, a bit rough because this is a work in progress. So what you're seeing here is an artificial character sitting on a bench. Um, and the interesting, well, yes, they do have some animation that they know how, you know, that they play back, but they are always kind of thinking about what to do next. And we don't know what they will do next, but they are also aware of each other. So this guy is all alone. He's lonely, he picks up his phone, should be a phone model there, pretty rough. And he starts talking on the phone. We don't know what the other people in the city, so here's someone, we did not know that he would come. He decides to sit there because he's tired. And he sits there, there are two, two of them, they're not interacting at all. Um, the guy in the, in the white coat, he sort of, okay, a hand goes through in the outside, and you know, modeling detail there, but he finishes his conversation. And now the green person knows he's done talking and starts talking to him. But we did not know this would happen. The gray shirt, the guy, he feels left out now. Uh, he's sort of like, oh, what's, you know, I'm kind of third wheel here. So he picks up his phone uh, and starts dialing somebody to talk to. This is all unscripted. This is just um, identifying places around town, like the bench, identifying activities they can do, and then letting them do all of the detailed workings of what they do every minute. So we want to introduce this also into this, uh, just a quick, quickly generate cities that are alive. And I think I will just end there. I just uh, wanted to leave this slide here that, that basically summarizes that, that the, a lot of this work is very labor and time intensive. And so automation methods may help us get something started and scanned environments. They have a lot of uh, positives, but they also have a lot of negatives or challenges that we have to deal with. Um, and hopefully we can sort of balance the detail of the scan things with the quick, uh, approaches of procedural and automated uh, generation uh, so that we can bring these uh, past and futures to life. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a bit over time, but still so interesting. I just couldn't stop because I find this very, very inspiring and, and gives a lot of thoughts about, I mean, there you're creating uh, with automatic, yeah, procedural automatic generation, something for the future, but okay, why, why, why can't we just use the same technology actually to, to uh, get insight into the past without spending two years on building something? And so, uh, any questions? It has been brief. We are we are running out of time, and we still have Jackie Aitken from TimeSpan to do her second presentation today. <laughs> are you good there online? Okay, then we just go for the last presentation, Jackie. Please, I'm sure we will discuss this with Hannes in the coffee break and then try the AR or the or from from the from the from west west okay there you go hmm this is that this is that last one we are supposed to stop here at 3 and then take coffee break on to until half past four. And then have the closing remarks here in the end. So, but oh, Jackie, that is working. Okay. You can use this one here. Um, you leave. Where's the pointer? The pointer is. Thank you. Two times in one day. Ooh.
Goodness me. Um, thank you, Schoolie. And uh, yeah, wow. Um, well, I think this is definitely the best afternoon session, you know. Uh, um, so, yes. Uh, so, Jackie again um, from Timespan in Scotland. And so I'm just going to quickly go through, um, end the afternoon with a story about a castle. Um, and this is just interesting because it just brings in quite a lot of the digital content considerations that we've talked about uh, this morning and this afternoon. Fascinating applications and uses of digital technology, past, present and future. And, and very interesting, the um, making the assets. So what we were trying to do as well, just before I go on to my presentation, really interesting about the time it takes to, to create uh, digital assets and uh, you know um, we, we were trying to create like all the assets for, for the Iron Age so that people can just use all the assets that there is um, and uh, or, or for fishing villages uh, once you because a lot of the houses were quite similar so once you make one you can just create a street you know but it, it's still a huge job and uh, yeah it takes takes a long time especially if you're really quite uh, um, want to get it really right in the detail. Anyway, so digital curation and content uh, consideration, where's the evidence? So I've just put this up here. This is where I work in Helmsdale. This is the River Helmsdale. Um, and this is the, the uh, North Sea out here. Um, but just um, this is a promontory of land. Um, and on top of it, you'll see a kind of ghostly kind of image of a tower up there. Um, and that is, uh, or was, uh, the remains or what there remained of Helmsdale Castle. So we had a castle at Helmsdale. Um, this is a location again, just to give you an idea of where we are, the location of the castle. So just a little bit of history around the castle itself very quickly. Um, it's always nice, you know, Scotland and castle seems to go hand in hand, but the castle was more of a tower house really. And it was built in 1488 in the reign of King James III. It was built for the landowner, um, the Countess uh, Magdalene Bailey, Countess of Sutherland and she was the, uh, the wife of uh, the seventh Earl, Earl of Sutherland. So where I live, the land ownership is all around, uh, was the Earldom of Sutherland, and then it uh, progressed to the Dukedom of Sutherland. Um, and so one landowner um, owning huge areas of land, um, and obviously they built these big, uh, big, uh, majestic houses for themselves while we're living in the little uh, um, black houses and long houses but one of them being Helmsdale ha Castle but this one was was on a specific location this is the river mouth here this is actually an old uh, map inset from around 1815 uh, so this is the river estuary here uh, that's the start of the fishing village of Helmsdale over here Oh, right, right. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, and okay, there, there. Okay, the river estuary. Is that okay? River estuary. And here is an artist or a cartographer artist depiction of what the, the, the kind of romanticized ruins of the castle of Helmsdale here. And um, yeah, so it, it was really used as a hunting lodge. It was at this position, you, if the landowners stay here, they could go and hunt in the big deer forests that were in this area, just about a couple of miles inland. And it was also strategically positioned here. It was about six miles from their main castle residence as well. So I'm trying to build up. It was quite an important building uh, for for for. If we talk about local, regional, and nationally important monuments, when it comes to archaeology, I mean, this is a way up there. 
uh, as castles go. So it was really important. Mm -hmm. Can you see? Yeah. So this is another um, image. Oh, so this is a photograph of Helmsdale. Can you see? Oh, is that if I just uh, oh, oh. oh yeah, you've got a move oh, that stick. It's sitting exactly oh, okay. at the <laughs> okay. I, I, right over the castle. Um, so yeah. So this is a really interesting photograph. Um, some things just to, to look at here in the photograph. Firstly, we live um, on an actively er eroding coastline. Um, and this is the castle teetering on the edge of this, uh, press, this area of raised beach. Um, it's actually a raised beach area here, which is, uh, created through isostatic recovery during the last ice age because we but this area is really very susceptible to the battering of the North Sea uh, tides um, and as you can see here at the harbour of Helmsdale the water is literally flooding uh, into the fishing boats this was taken around about 19 maybe 50s kind of time so it's not current day this was a, a quite a few, a few decades ago but you can see the forces that are exerting themselves on this structure up here. Um, we've also, as you can see, the top photograph, the, the, the remains of the castle was really under constant threat. It was being undermined uh, by several effects, but mostly uh, the erosion on the coast. And because um, the actual, uh, uh, grand, uh, sandy gravel of the raised beach wasn't offering much protect, protection. Once it was under mild, it mind, it just literally fell away. Um, there is data that we could access on coastal erosion around Scotland's coastlines. It's called dynamic coast, I think, <laughs> um, of Scotland, done through uh, Glasgow University. And we can actually see here, just by a little simple demonstration, between uh, 1890 and 1970, 32.9 metres of land on this promontory <clears throat> had been lost. And actually that's true because we've got photographs from around eight, about 1880 showing a settlement in this area, uh, which had literally been washed away. But just showing you the threats that this poor little castle of ours had been under in the past. Um, so what was the state of the castle really? So yeah, the things that were affecting it, um, it around about 1969, 1970, these were the dialogues going in the village at that time of Helmsdale. And um, at that time there were need for infrastructures um, and new roads to be built. So the type of dialogues at that time were the laws, the local authority laws governing archeology span were inadequate. So there was not, can you believe it, laws um, that could protect this castle from its, its fate. Um, there was some kind of, um, 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 some kind of attitude to archaeology as well from, from, from the population that it's old, it doesn't matter. Um, it's a dangerous structure. It was surrounded by these fences to stop people obviously getting too near it. You might end up with a huge masonry on your head. Um, there was also um, the feeling that it was too late. Nothing could be done about it. And yes, uh, they probably did leave it too late because the coastal erosion had got to it, um, as you can see here, <laughs> right on the edge. But the, the end fate of the castle was really determined by um, the, the majority of feeling that the population wanted a new main road uh, to go over um, the river of Helmsdale and actually it's the part of the main A9 network and it travels all the way through Scotland um, and the population felt that the 
that actually a new road would what was the um, what was was what they would rather have than uh, to be able to save the castle, and indeed that's what happened. So, um, as you can see here, in 1970 the castle was actually um, demolished to make way for a new road bridge. Um, seems quite unbelievable that in Scotland that we knock down castles. But as you can see, it's not a, it's quite a complex um, dialogue within local communities, within planning departments. At that time, our museum didn't even exist. So we didn't even have a way of saying what we thought about what was going to happen. But now our museum takes a much more um, direct and, and involved and action led. Uh, we really do have a voice and we, we, we tell our um, councils our opinions about archaeological sites where we live. Um, so as you can see here, um, this was 1968, the castle is there. And in 2015, in the same location, the castle's gone, but we've got our new road bridge and that new line of communication, um, um, which um, really is far, was far better for traffic at that time. The old road bridge was a double arched um, stone road bridge uh, built in 1811 and it was only single, uh, uh, single lane. So it was inadequate for all the the, uh, the lorries and, and so forth and logging lorries that were coming and tourists coming up and down the road. So 50 years on, um, what was the consensus looking back on such a, a series of events? And I'm probably oversimplifying it because it was really quite interesting to look at a particular case of this castle. Um, but the consensus really was when Timespan kind of opened up some projects around the castle. Um, we're hearing a lot of people reminiscing about it. Um, we're saying, oh, Helmsdale used to have a castle, you know, but um, it's gone now. Um, and then when we embarked on our digital journey, and um, in fact, we were in the Sina uh, project and we were recreating the village of Helmsdale. So we've done a village and we created the village of Helmsdale and it didn't have the castle in it. And um, the one thing that the people, when we opened it up to kind of a demonstration of what we produced, and we asked the local community, well, what do you think of the village of Helmstall? Isn't it wonderful? We've recreated it. Did, they said, well, where's the castle? Because you've recreated something in 1890 and the castle would have been there. So where's the castle? And we're thinking, ah, you know it's that? That with everything? But that was, that was a big learning curve for us because we thought by adding the castle again would take a long time to do. We didn't really know about how to do a castle. I mean, buildings, yes, um, we could do that. And again, we we're trying to keep things as authentic as possible. So the community were very dead set that no, 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 take your model back, get that castle in the model. And they really wanted the castle of Helmsdale back. So we had to listen to them, but then we had to, think to ourselves, well, where is the evidence for the castle? As you all know, if a site's excavated, if it's not excavated, if there's good archival records, but starting with the ground plan, well, we had a very basic ground plan, but we had a ground plan. Um, and I mean, I've got no recollection of the castle myself before it was knocked down. So a lot of it's anecdotal. Some of the photographs we really had to scrutinize. Um, it, it's, it's so we eventually managed to determine. Um, so, as I say, we had a basic ground plan, and here it is you know, it's got about three or four or five stories. And this area here, this part is a this is the spiral staircase where you can access the different floors. And over here, there was a bit of a courtyard as well, but this was the main living kind of area for, for, for people staying at the castle and feasting in one of the fe feasting hall in the, in the hunting lodge as well. So we were able to get a basic ground plan. Sarah Kennedy um, is the, um, uh, the digital modeler with St. Andrew's um, Open Virtual Worlds. 
and she was able to take the ground plan as you, they do and sort of start building up the castle and then it will be transported into the virtual world environment of Helmsdale in 1890. But before we did that, we really wanted to make the castle as authentic as possible. The castle was built in 1460s, but our uh, representation of the castle was, we were putting it back in 1890. So the castle was not even complete. It was a ruin in 1890. So we thought we'd better be faithful although you can play around with it, and we placed the castle back into the model as a ruin, as we believed it would have looked in 1890, because we've got good sketches. We've got, um, as you can see here, we can see, um, we can see certain archways we, uh, archways, we can see where the windows are. Um, so we can get pieces of architectural detail and we can build on it. We did have a mass of photos as well. So I'm not showing you everything here. So we can determine masonry construction. We can determine, we can even, I mean, we even know where some of the stonework is. We could go and find some of the stonework. When they knock down the castle, they use some of the stone of the castle as the foundations for the new road bridge. Um, and the Countess of Sutherland, so the landowner, um, um, a few hundred years later at the time of the clearances, um, she actually was a, a quite a good um, sketcher, a painter. So she depicts the castle here and we could see what it looked like in around 1800 with kind of crow step kind of uh, roof structure without the actual it's, it's just the gables, but not the roofs itself, and possible chimneys as well. But we didn't really have too much else. So we really had to do comparative examples around Scotland. And there, there is only a few plans for tower houses, although there's lots of variations to that plan. So we did look around to see what we could find. Uh, so this one kind of has quite a lot of similarities. The inner uh, interiors would have been vaulted like this as well. Um, so there's quite a lot of features we could build upon. And the thicknesses of the walls and where the different floor levels would have been located with the timber floor uh, frames. And then we did all this comparative work. Um, so we, the, the main features we were able to determine through this, we were quite lucky. It wasn't a big castle, but it, it, it was, you know, it, it's, it's what we had. Um, and so we were, we were able to get all the features, as I've just said. And then we were able to make the castle, um, up, as you can see here. So reconstructing the castle, um, putting it back into the Helmsdale model. Um, this is... Um, and you can just about see the spiral staircase here. So even in the model now, it is, it is, a, it is a ruin. It is as it's what, it, it's as accurate as we can get it. And we feel it's, it, you know, we feel we've done quite a good job in keeping it quite authentic. The area of land that the castle sits on is actually called uh, fondly by the local community as Castle Park. So it's actually very much part of their memory of a particular area of land. And actually, the land where the castle is, is where Helmsdale actually has its Highland Games. And for the first time in three years, we have Highland Games again this year. So, you know, there was very much, a, 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 people were just really happy that the castle was put back, uh, back where it should be. Um, and in our, if you listened, or if you were there in the morning to the talk, um, these models, these fully immersive models, you can explore the castle in and out, you can go into it, you can, um, you can go around the whole village of Helmsdale if you uh, access our real rights exhibition on our website. Uh, we've got all our immersive models that you can access from the real rights exhibition um, on there. But 
that wasn't the end of the story and it never should be you know there's a lot more to the the journey that you're on so this is in our collection and this is a lintel from the castle and it's a protracted story how we got it but it's in our our um, museum it's secured in a recess in in there but there's no context around this lintel stone at all although I thought you might be interested in if I can get this up very quickly it has an inscription underneath it in Latin um let me just see oh it's got an inscription underneath it in Latin Oh, sorry, on it, if you can see here, there's writing over here, which I thought is quite, quite amusing. I don't know if Iceland is anything like Scotland, but this is very true of us and me in my behaviour. If you wish to be wise, I enjoin you to observe six things. What you say and about whom, where, to whom, how and when. And that's very much a Highlander's way. Every time we see, so, when we're speaking, we always look behind us just to, to make sure. That, not that we're seeing anything bad, it's just the way things, you know, the way we do it. So we had um, the, so that we had the lintel. So we thought, hmm, what do we do with this? We also have another connection with the castle. It is famed for a triple uh, a murder plot that went terribly wrong. It was a triple poisoning. Um, the earls of Sutherland who built the, the castle were always feuding with the landowners across the border in Caithness and they wanted Sutherland and they were all, so they were, he, so the Earl of Caithness was trying to rid Sutherland of its rightful heir by poisoning a young boy on returning from a deer hunting trip. Now triple poisoning, uh, now we don't know, but it has been faithfully um, kind of recorded that that episode in the castle in 1567 really happened. I mean, it's amazing to read the story, but it's allegedly inspired William Shakespeare to write his Hamlet. So that's another amazing story to have with our little castle at Helmsdale. So those two things, the lintel, and the castles, the poisoning at the castle and the link with uh, William Shakespeare. So we went back to the digital developers and we said, can we put the lintel back into the castle? Um, we know that the castles are ruined, but we play around with it and actually put it back in with a fire going. And we've actually placed some goblets on top of the lintel. It's a fireplace lintel. So we paste them. So, as if to recreate the scene where the poison and the goblets were and um, the poisoning took place. So we did that and we think it's worked really effectively. The actual, um, we didn't need photogrammetry. We had really nice, because actually the, um, the lintel was in a recess. We couldn't get the lintel out. Um, so we actually took really good photographs and they have been placed and wrapped around uh, the digital frame of that asset and it's been imported into the, uh, the search engine for uh, this model and we think it works really well and what it does um, again what I feel very I think we should be doing is telling stories so if you go into our castle you can go and um, this is a kula and kula is like round me so it allows you to to pick points in your 3D models and do live, um, well, to do three, 360 degree tours from a location in your model. So in here, you can go in and you can click and you can get the story of the poisoning in the castle. Um, so, and it can actually hear, I mean, you can put anything in it, film, video, whatever you want. But I think, I really think it's a really good way of merging what was there when the poisoning took place the ruin of the castle um, and, and also the architecture. Um, you know, it's got so many different uses. And here we have it here 
where if you go into cooler storage, I have not done any live stuff because I, I was thinking if I did that, it's going to go wrong. So I just kept it as screenshots. But this is a, so the castle is back in Helmsdale where it belongs. We're telling stories, we're discussing climate change, coastal erosion, um, and we're talking about the preservation of sites where we live and creating dialogues with planning departments about maybe, you know, thinking twice about when they go to knock another castle down. So it's just an interesting story about what, how we went about um, that particular digital reconstruction. <laughs> And uh, well, we have run out of time and caffeine, maybe. <laughs> so, but uh, let's see. Let's see. Oh, they are there still online, three of them. <laughs> but uh, so, any one question for Tiaki or? Well, we just take it in the coffee break. Coffee, I yeah, I think it's coffee. I think that's the thing we need now before we head into the closing remarks at the end of the day. So I just thank, thank you all who presented in this session. And uh, it was a really broad spectrum, I think, and really takes your brains to start to wander around all kinds of of techie stuff and then also just how we how we think about authenticity and and uh, auto generated things in it and and augmented reality i mean so many things but yeah i don't i just want to give the hand to all the panelists here thank you over there on, online this will all be edited and re the recordings and and uh, put them on uh, and published on our media so it will be accessible afterwards but uh, now we just end this session and head for coffee <laughs>